Are you able to share? Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, um, Dr. Kavita, for that uh, lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to be on this uh, webinar and uh, to share my um, my experience of how what we do and how when we do breast MRI and uh, just a few cases. So um, thank you once again. So I'm um, okay. So first of all, when do you do an MRI? We ask slightly different here in the UK that we we kind of have quite a strict case selection when it comes to when we want to offer MRI. So we're just going to look at the indications. Then we look at what sequences we follow in our unit in Edinburgh and uh, a little bit, um, maybe a couple of slides on contrast enhanced spectral mammography, which is a very new technique um, which is just quite recently take, taken off here and how it compares to MR and some cases that some we can look at together. Um, so I'm just trying to see if I can, yeah. So indications is one of the primary reason that we do an MRI is we want to characterize the lesions. Why do we want to characterize the lesions? Because we want to know what the tumor size is and whether conservation is possible. And for more like a pre-op staging, whether it's a, it's a T1 or a T2 um, and uh, whether they can, we can do some kind of a therapeutic mammoplasty and offer better cosmetic result. Um, so that's one of the commonest reasons to do an MRI. And also it is he helpful to um, discriminate between um, benign and malignant lesions. So, um, and also if you see DCIS, if you need to know if it's a DCIS on the mammogram and your biopsy, you want to know if there's some kind of, a, if there's an element of tumor invasion there. So uh, you want to know if there is an invasive component, why is that important is, if there is even micro invasion, um, then um, the lady will need a sentinel node biopsy. So you need to know whether there is an invasive component in the lesion. And often invasion, as you know, is it looks different on the MRI. And to find out if there is any additional tumor foci in the, in the ipsilateral breast, because breast cancers, um, they can be, um, multicentric, it can be in more than one quadrant, and that will influence management. So it all comes down to what is the best form of surgery that you can offer for the lady. Um, and also to detect, as we know, about 25, up to about 25% of breast cancers can be bilateral. So you want to detect any additional tumor foci in the contralateral breast. Um, high risk screening. We have a family history screening program in the UK where, um, depending on their family history risk, they are offered a mammogram. Uh, and um, additionally, sometimes an MRI. Lobular cancers, often we tend to do MRIs because Lobular cancers can be quite tricky to map on mammograms. So the extent of the disease often can be underestimated on a mammogram. So we went, we tend to do MRI. And disease which is occult on mammography, dense breast, because I, as you can know, if the dense density is a birads for breast density, it can mask very tiny cancers. And as we discussed earlier, contralateral breast disease, post-op surveillance, and also to find out what is the response to neoadjuvant chemo, because it could be a, a grade three triple negative and it could be an extensive disease. But once they give chemotherapy, what they thought might be something requiring a mastectomy might have responded really well to the chemotherapy. So you want to know whether it is um, um, what the response is. So again, comes down to helpful for surgery. And 
last but not the least, it is a problem solving tool. Um, so again, we've just briefly said about documenting response to chemotherapy um, and also abbreviated protocols. Now, there are very few centers which do abbreviated MRI, but this is can be used as a screening tool sometimes because here, here your screening is basically what you do is you're looking for disease in an otherwise well woman. So it can be a rapid way of um, acquiring the MR. So you don't have, we, there is a lot of demand for MRI in, in every center in the UK. So you want to offer this, this good modality or this investigation to as many women as possible, but you're often limited by the amount of time available on the scanner. So abbreviated MRI protocols are often useful there. Um, and I, of course, in dense breast, it's superior to mammography because you can detect any occult cancer for site. So what sequences do we do? It's very variable, okay? Every center might have their own sequences, but what we tend to do is we do a T1, T, T2, then we give the contrast. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a contrast enhanced T1 sequence because you wanna see, like get an overview of the viscera and what's happening elsewhere. And then um, the delayed subtracted images, we tend to acquire it about one to seven minutes. So, um, and then um, MIP, the maximum intensity projection, is quite good to give an overview because when you, I tend to, when I report my MRI, I tend to first look at the MIP sequence so that I get a bit of an overview of what's going on. Um, and then you also can get an idea of the angiogenesis within the, um, in relation to the tumor, which is particularly valuable for the surgeon. Then curves, again, curves, uh, it's, a, it's a debatable topic because, um, you can make a curve look like anything. So it's just depending on where you're going to plot the area of interest. Um, so if you have a good physicist in your team, then the value of curves, it's immense. And um, it can be really helpful to kind of map the disease to find out whether it's got a, uh, what the washout is like. But uh, again, um, you need to have a good physicist on your team. Uh, implant sequences are slightly different from what you would do because we, if we are just looking at for just implant integrity, then we don't give GAD. We don't give gadolinium because there's a lot of debate right now about gadolinium. What are the effects of gadolinium? Should we be giving too much gadolinium, especially for screening, high-risk screening? Well, it is still kind of... Um, it, we all know that, uh, and this holds true for any, any kind of MRI where you give uh, GAD. So um, it's quite variable on what, how, what is going to come out later in the literature. We, we just got to wait and watch. But at this point, we don't, do not give gadolinium if we are doing any kind of an um, implant sequence. Field strength, what kind of, um, um, you need at least 1.5 Tesla. Um, the newer ones are coming with three Tesla, but uh, nothing less than 1.5 because there's no point in doing uh, breast MRI if it's less than 1.5. You need a dedicated breast coil to do breast MRI, okay? Um, so when we start reporting, then how do you report an MR? So you've got your sequences. So how I start reporting is I look at the breast density. So you know that if your mammogram is a dense breast, then you will, you will have um, 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 the dense tissue on the MRI, but necessarily the benign parenchymal enhancement or rather what's called the background benign parenchymal enhancement need not be in relation to the density of the breast. So these are some examples where there are four different types the, the first one on the left is a very minimal benign parenchymal enhancement. And it, this is actually the best MRI to look at because you're able to pick up any enhancement, enhancing foci really well. Then you have, which is slightly a little more enhancement, um, but again, quite good for image interpretation. Then comes the moderate level of benign pack parenchymal enhancement. So this can sometimes be a little tricky because um, if it's a very tiny enhancing focus, you're not going to see. And the worst thing that you can get is when you have 
extensive benign parenchymal enhancement where you just cannot see anything at all. And so it is very important if you're coming across something like that to say that the sensitivity is very much limited when you have um, an extensive enhancement. So, um, and also when you're trying to report an MR, there are different terminologies that you need to know. Um, you, you have anything less than five millimeters, you call it as a focus and you cannot characterize it because if it, it's too small for us to characterize, you cannot put a curve on it and say this is benign or malignant. So you probably would say it's a five millimeter enhancing force. I am not able to characterize it. Then you've got the mass like enhancement. These are the actual solid invasive lesions, which, which cause like a mass like um, a lesion on the MR. Then you have a non mass enhancement, which is, uh, which is like from DC, sometimes from DCIS or micro invasion. So it is just you should, or usually if it is associated with mass like lesions, it's quite contiguous that way. And you should always. Remember things like intramammary nodes, uh, do not, and you know sometimes they can be enhancing. So again, and um, nodes can look T one on T one they look low dense, but they can be enhancing. So you need to compare your different sequences before you call something as an abnormal node. Okay, so something to remember. Um, this is some examples of the type of enhancements that you can come across. As you can see, it's very variable. So this is a whole spectrum from a mass-like to a more clumpy enhancement. So if you read your textbooks, you would say, they would say stippled enhancement and clumpy enhancement. So the pattern, you don't, we don't usually describe it. We just say mass-like enhancing lesion and give, give the dimensions in all the three dimensions you need to give. You need to give your anterior posterior, your, um, your transverse and your craniocaudal. All the three dimensions are important because if you think of your mammogram, if you're reporting your mammogram, you would give the three different measurements. So it's very important to give that. And then when you describe enhancement, it could be a, a clumpy or a stippled or uh, as you can see in this, that there is there is this patchy non-mass-like enhancement. And uh, so these are just various examples that you would come across that it need not strictly um, um, adhere to a pattern, but it could be uh, quite variable. So non-mass-like enhancement is often associated with DCIS and it is segmental or clumped. So segmental is the most common. Again, going back to your mammograms and interpretation of mammograms, whenever you have any segmental calcifications, you are always worried about it because you're thinking DCIS. So coming back to this segmental, again, uh, non-mass-like enhancement is about uh, very common, 67% it is associated with it, or it can be a clumpy ductal enhancement which is seen in about 31% of the cases. Ductal enhancement often comes from malignant causes like DCIS, invasive cancer. Again, DCIS could be associated with microinvasion. Um, and uh, sometimes certain benign, what we classify as benign, benign pathologically, uh, like ADH, LCIS, um, they can be associated with, with a high, atypical features, so their uh, pre-malignant potential is quite high. So they may be associated with enhancement. So in that case, you would say it's strictly indeterminate and you will have to biopsy it. Then of course, ductal hyperplasia, fibrosis sometimes can have a ductal type of enhancement. Fibrocystic change. So if you just think about the pathology of it, anything going back to your pathology, and how it looks, fibrocystic change is essentially changes which occur within the ducts. So it could have a benign type of an enhancement. So you, you always classify it as a mass or non-mass like. So what is mass and non-mass? Mass is, is a 3D mass lesion, which is why I said you have to get your dimensions in all the three, transverse, craniocaudal, and AP. 
So you've got to get it all in all the three. It's a 3D mask-like lesion. Non-mask means it's something segmental. It's something which doesn't, which doesn't, it is not focal. It's not confluent, but it kind of is, it's not something you can really measure. So that is a non-mask type of enhancement. Then coming a little bit about curves. Again, like I said, I'm slightly skeptical about curves and that's my personal opinion because you can make anything look um, like anything on a curve. It just, so you need to have a good physicist on your team if you're going to do curves. You need a special software um, to do curves. So there are three types of curves. It, so it's an it's a initial uptake of contrast. So if you can remember, we have the dynamic sequences after giving the contrast. So the curves where the, where the tissue picks up the thing and then how, how does it wash it out? So if it, if it persists, that you're thinking more like something which is a, going on like a benign thing. Now, if it doesn't really wash out, it just kind of plateaus out. You know that there is a difference, but it's, it's really not uh, persisting, but it just plateaus out then you're, you have to be a little bit cautious because you cannot kind of say, okay, this is benign. I'm not going to do anything about it. So you would think this is probably an indeterminate lesion and you would need to do a biopsy of it. Then you have your rapid washout where you know that you're, you're dealing with something more sinister. So then we look at some real cases, okay? For the next 15, 20 minutes, perhaps. Um, so um, this, I don't know how well it's projected, but then this is a case where you have only the MLA view of the mammogram and you have a fairly mixed and dense type of breast tissue and you're able to see a distortion like a speculate lesion right there. And um, so this came back as a lobular cancer. Now, Lobular cancers can have a wide variety of presentations. They can be mass-like, or they can be like an asymmetric density, or they, they can be a distortion. Because if you actually think about the pathology, again, of lobular cancers, they, they actually arise from the lobule of the breast rather than from a duct in the breast. So they do not have that kind of, it doesn't have to breach the duct to kind of spread. So. Sometimes it can be quite insidious and slow growing, but it can be quite extensive. But in this case, we saw a, a, a kind of a specular density, a distortion, which came back as a lobular cancer. And like we said, it's one of the indications for doing an MRI. So we did an MRI and the MRI, as you can see, there is a little bit of a background parenchymal uh, enhancement, which is quite moderate, um, which is what you're getting from all this. And you can see this speculate enhancing lesion, um, which is kind of, it looks to be the right place. It's when you see how far behind the nipple it is. But in addition to this, you're picking up a couple of more foci. Now, this one I probably would think is less than five millimeters. So I would not characterize it. And, but if you just look at this, which is very close to the primary tumor, and you have a little enhancing area. And then posterior to that, you have another enhancing bit. And you've got a little bit of enhancement between the two. So you don't know if there's more disease going on. So what would you do next is we in our center and most places within the UK, you would recall the patient back after the NTT, you would discuss, get the patient back and do what's called a focused second look ultrasound to look, to look for any other foci. Um, so that's what we did. As you can see, all these lesions were there. So we did a focus second look ultrasound and we found further foci. And then you biopsy it, you mark the disease so that the surgeon knows what they would expect. Because once they go into the surgery and they, they, they do a wide local excision, then if you have positive margins, then you basically are going to be going in for re-excisions. So that becomes slightly difficult, putting the lady through another procedure. And then as a radiologist, you feel you've not mapped the disease adequately. So it's always important that if you need to choose your investigation wisely, okay? 
Um, this is another case where um, very dense breasts and um, and it, it, um, it actually was a case with lots of calcifications, which is quite difficult to see because of um, the, the we've just got a static image and you don't have a proper monitor. So a very it's quite heterogeneously dense tissue. So the same case, uh, so she had calcifications on the right side, which was quite extensive, segmental. And on the left side, she's got the spiculate lesion, which is um, um, which looks suspicious. So we decided to do an MRI. So we did an MRI. As you can see, again, lots of background parenchymal enhancement. So this becomes quite tricky for the radiologist. Sorry, I'll just go on to that. Now, of course, this in a case like this where you know you've got dense breasts and you've got DCIS on one side and you've got a spiculate lesion on the other side and you go and do an MR and there was all this background parenchymal enhancement. So it's quite difficult to know in a case like this, which is not actually showing the a cancer on this side, but what I was trying to show is so much of background parenchymal enhancement. So what do you say to the surgeon then? as a radiologist, you know, you, you kind of, you're, you're, you're kind of stuck at a point where you can't say which is disease. There's so much enhancement in both the breasts. So this is slightly tricky. So, um, so you've got to kind of sometimes own up and say, you know, we cannot really map the disease. The MR is not very sensitive. So you just do the biopsies of the calx, find out what the extent is, because sometimes and mammogram might be more superior to an MRI in mapping the disease. So every case is specific and one size doesn't fit all, okay? Um, then this is another case where you've got the MLO views on both sides. And the one thing that we cannot see anything on the mammograms at first glance, but you're seeing some enlarged nodes there which are quite prominent compared to the other side, whereas on the left, it's very fatty nodes, but here you see very dense nodes. So this lady actually presented to the one-stop breast clinic with um, a swelling in the axilla. So we, they, they could palpate nodes. Then we did an ultrasound um, and the ultrasound showed replacement type nodes. So we biopsied it. Then we scanned the breast on that side. We couldn't find anything other than enlarged nodes. So we biopsied the nodes because then we gave a differential. Well, this could be a lymphoma. This could be a breast cancer. We don't know what's causing these nodes that came back as a breast primary. So then we did an MRI. So when we did the MRI, we were like essentially looking to see, was it something which is a cult on mammogram that you're going to find on an MR? And we found these enlarged nodes, which were similar to what we saw on the mammogram, but the MRI showed an area of non-mass type enhancement or rather kind of, you know, um, an enhancing areas within the medial left breast. If you can see the nodes are on the right side, you're having an enhancement on the left side, but the pathology has come back as a breast primary. So what did we do? We had him scan the left side. So we got the lady back in, scanned the left, and that came back as a lobular cancer in the contralateral breast. So this goes to show that breast cancer is a very tricky, tricky disease to map because here you're having, on in the left breast, you've got a lobular cancer, which is actually metastasized to the contralateral right axilla, and it has caused these replacement type nodes. So of course, you know, so what would they do next? So there was a discussion again in the MTT. So we took the lady up for a second look ultrasound. We found some kind of um, textural hypoechoic change in the medial breast. So we biopsied that on the left-hand side. And then the lady essentially had surgery, then axillary node clearance on the other side, and she had radiotherapy. So um, it was quite an interesting scenario. Of course, we should think about implants. Implants is a very difficult thing for the radiologist. Sometimes on ultrasound, 
Pamogram, you can never know if an implant is compromised. So if you, and it's often a clinical diagnosis. So, but then if you need to find out whether there is a rupture of the implant, then MRI is quite helpful as a tool. And in this case, you can see that um, there are prominent nodes, which is caused by silicon in the implants. So this lady had both an intra and an extra capsular rupture. Why is it important? Because you have to distinguish between the two. Um, you need to tell them that, you know, it's an intra and an extra capsular rupture because they need, if it's an extra capsular rupture, then it's extravasation of the silicon. Um, and here you can see the typical linguine sign, which you would have read about in your textbook. So I'm not going to go much into it. And you've got the silicon nodes there. So again, there are different types of signs, salad oil sign, linguine sign. Um, so you can read up all about it. So this is an example of a silicon node on ultrasound where you can see that snowstorm appearance, which we can identify. So this is another case um, where it's a reconstructed breast and it's a treated breast. And uh, so the initial disease was quite occult. So we decided to do, um, I mean, quite dense breast, as you can see on the mammogram. So we decided to do an MRI. So when we did the MRI, you can see there's a lot of enhancing tissue on this side, uh, which is a treated breast. So there's an implant, um, some, some reconstruction has been done. And there was a lot of calcifications, which I think is projected quite well on the mammogram. And it's causing all this non-mass type asymmetric enhancement. Whenever you see some asymmetric enhancement, and um, on the MRI, always go and biopsy it, okay? So this was a case of a recurrence in a, in a treated breast. Um, so non-mass-like enhancement, it's the same case, and it was DCIS. So this is another case where you can see a nice, um, solid, ill-defined mass on the mammogram, and then, and it's got a little, uh, ex satellite next to it. Similarly, you have a solid lesion with a little satellite next to it. So in this instance, it's probably a grade three triple negative. So we decided to do an MRI um, because we want to know uh, if the lady is going to have new adjuvant treatment and then if it's going to be conservation, then you need to know how the response is. So in this case, if you see, um, so the lesion is there, and if you can see the, the breast at this side, it's been infiltrated. So it's much larger on the MR compared to the mammogram. So sometimes when it's an infiltrating lesion, you will see that um, on an MRI, the, the breast which is affected by the cancer tends to be quite smaller than the other side. So it's not necessarily if it's a mass, it'll be bigger. Sometimes it can be smaller. So in this case, the lady had an MRI because um, she was getting neoadjuvant treatment. Um, and, uh, and then probably, depending on the response, they would have gone for conservation. So another case, uh, quite dense breast tissue. Uh, however, if you see when the mammogram is so dense, but there's very little background enhancement. Nodes, we saw the nodes, again, came back as a breast primary. Um, but we couldn't see anything on the MR. So they just did an axillary node clearance and the lady had radiotherapy. This is another example where um, very heterogeneously nodular dense breast tissue and you've got a cancer there um, and there is a lot of nodularity. So again, this is the value of uh, when it's dense tissue, doing an MRI is helpful because you found the cancer, what you're seeing on the mammogram but you, in the contralateral breast, we saw another tiny little cancer. So she had bilateral breast cancer. So we go back, we looked for this lesion, found it, biopsied it, and then um, she had some letrozole or something, and then she had wide local excisions. Then this was another case, very interesting case. This was, this had, um, um, basically um, had an angiosarcoma of the chest wall, which had been excised and then had an MRI. And uh, because it was in the chest wall, had a mammogram incidentally, and it showed really there was an asymmetry between both breasts. 
increase in the detrabiculation, etymatis, and we didn't, we actually, we didn't know about the background of, there was a background of sarcoma. So we actually, you know, um, we wrote back to the clinician and asked what was it, and then we looked back in the notes. We did an MRI, and as you can see, there's a lot of enhancement there of the, and very infiltrative. So this is a very interesting case that we wrote up. Um, a little bit about the newer modalities, um, like I said, contrast enhanced spectral mammography and abbreviated MRI. Contrast enhanced spectral mammography is just taken over, just coming into um, practice in the UK. Um, it is, um, it's basically, if somebody cannot tolerate an MR, then it's quite helpful. And also sometimes it's a lot more simpler. So how does it work is, Oh, sorry, I'll just, um, I think, um, so this is actually a diagnostic uh, abbreviated MRI protocol. And uh, so we'll first, I'll just go over that. So it's much more shorter uh, when you talk an, about an abbreviated MRI. We touched based on it previously slightly. Um, so it's a short sequence when they have a negative mammogram, um, um, a BIRATS one or two, or within 11 months um, of, uh, of their scheduled uh, examination, those who are asymptomatic. And the lifetime risk for cancer is uh, when it's less than uh, 20%, then you can go for this. It's to just save the time on the scanner. Contrast enhanced spectral mammography, it's a mammographic technique, as it suggests. It's a dual energy exposure that you, um, um, which is undertaken following the injection of a contrast. So uh, we do the standard views for both the breasts. There's a lot of literature available, so I'm not going to go much into it. And we have limited experience. We just started it in our center. So, um, um, so basically you, you just acquire two views and then, um, you, you're able to map the disease. So if somebody cannot tolerate an MRI claustrophobic, then CESM is a good alternate to that. And, um, but then again, you need to remember it's contrast. So contrast associated risk is always there. Um, and it's almost like getting a mammogram for a lady. So it's not like they have to be within the MRI scanner. So this is an example for an, uh, um, a very simple contrast enhanced mammography thing which uh, where, where often it is not and comparing it to an MRI. So this is how a CESM image looks. So the subtracted image and quite comparable, but you will not get all that information on angiogenesis and everything. Um, so it's quite valuable in a way that it can be used as an alternate, but then there is very limited um, information right now, which is available. A lot of it is being done in Europe. But in the UK, we've, uh, there was one center which, which, which actually led the way in England, but uh, we've just introduced it in our unit as well. So it, it is a valuable tool. Um, so that's me. Uh, just a very brief overview. There are plenty of courses available for MRI breasts. Most of them run for a day, couple of days. Um, so um, you know, if you want to learn more extensively, it might be worthwhile going into one of these courses and attending them. Um, but uh, this is just a little bit of an overview on what we do and just some cases. So quite happy to take questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gauri, for this presentation and very nicely, you know, your cases are very nice. And then uh, you made it very clear, the indications and all. So now we have a uh, few of our senior uh, consultant radiologists uh, who practice uh, breast imaging. So I invite Dr. Uh, Juala uh, for her comments and then uh, any questions if at all. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and um, a very nice uh, presentation, Dr. Gavi. Pleasure listening to you. And um, uh, I practice in a center where we have uh, the hologic uh, system with the uh, ability to do contrast. And uh, so I have also just started uh, doing contrast mammography and I do find it quite uh, useful in the sense uh, 
uh, we do, uh, uh, you know, uh, especially because it's it's much quicker than uh, slotting them for an MRI, and you know, um, the times, uh, the waiting times are so much for MR. So I find it very easy to put them through the contrast, and then uh, I've uh, found it quite useful. And yeah. my question to you is. Um, now, of course, the T1, T2 and the subtracted and post-contrast uh, subtracted are good. But uh, how is, uh, I mean, how is the practice uh, I and mean, how are you looking at diffusions in the UK? I mean, do you look at diffusions in ADCs at all or uh, you don't depend on that at, uh, we don't, at all? We don't. Yeah. We don't, we don't yeah. do that because firstly, um, the value of it, there is a very nice article if you if you go on to, um, uh, I think it was, uh, it is one of the radiologists from Vienna who's, who's, uh, um, who's written a little bit about the value of diffusion weighted imaging and uh, the limitations, you know, again, if you look at where is the value of diffusion weighted? We mostly use it in neuro, isn't it? And, mm. and, uh, and, uh, and, and if you look at breast cancers, are we, um, we, we don't use diffusion weighted and we don't mm. think um, it is it has contributed very much. We tried it for a bit. One of our radiologists mm. went away on a course and then when she came back and, and we tried it for a bit and we just felt that it has got very limited. Um, yeah, uh, the lot of overlap uh, probably because of the, uh, the, the, uh, the heterogeneity of breast cancers, you know. Um, the low grades and the high grades and the, the lot of overlap in their ADC values and so the specificity yeah. doesn't really help no, uh, in improving the specificity. It, we, we felt we gave up on it very quickly because yeah. in a, in a, in a, and we are one of the biggest centers in, um, and we are a specialist cancer center and mm. uh, uh, we are one of the biggest screening centers and we, we have a um, and detect a large number of cancers and do a lot of MRIs. Um, mm. And we have very quickly decided that it is not going to contribute. It doesn't contribute very much and it has no way reduced um, or uh, no way increased um, mm -hmm. uh, the pickup rate or uh, mm -hmm. any more mm -hmm. additional information we are able to gauge from it. Yeah, so, sure. yeah. Now, me, my other question is, uh, because you mentioned CSM versus MRI, I just wanted uh, to know your thoughts on uh, the BRCA uh, subcategory of uh, women and uh, who are young, who are, who are in their 30s, where the background parenchymal enhancement is going to limit our, uh, our confidence of uh, reporting the MRI, you think because the noise is pretty less in CSM, in the, in the contrast enhanced mammography, you think uh, uh, trying out a contrast enhanced mammogram would be better on them than to run them through the MRI because MRI does fox you because so much of enhancement in these young women. Um, so I just wanted to know your thoughts and th thoughts on that. Well, at the moment, I think we have not extended contrast enhanced spectral mammography to high risk screening. So we, mm -hmm. uh, we are still doing MRIs. And again, you have to think about young women radiation risk as well. Um, mm -hmm. So um, abri that's where I think abbreviated MRI might have a role. Of course, there is that thing about background enhancement, but then it is, it is, it, 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 it is again depends a lot on the timing of your MR, isn't it? Your background clinical enhance, um, background parenchymal enhancement. Sometimes you can minimize it. Um, it is a difficult. So that's where you know perhaps personalized screening might come into play. Uh, if somebody's mm -hmm. got a dense breast, then is there something else you can do as an adjunct tool? Or uh, you, again, one like I said, one size might not fit all. Um, mm -hmm. We have not. Uh, um, uh, we we are not doing contrast enhanced at the moment for our high risk screening. But we've been having a family history screening program mm -hmm. since many years, mm -hmm. and we've been offering. If it's a moderate MRI. risk, we use so only mammograms. If it's a high risk, then we use uh, mammograms and MRI. Alternating. alternating so alternating in the sense like six months uh, for they might have a mammogram uh, in the first half of the year then MRI in the second half of the year 
So that's what we've been doing. But uh, I don't know the value of uh, how, again, if we look at, you might know from your experience as well, looking at contrast images, um, sometimes it's quite comparable and can be quite spurious. And we have just introduced it. So we don't have a huge database of cases. So hopefully, I think maybe in a year's time, I may be able to answer this to this question uh, once we've gone through a lot more cases. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Hi, uh, this is Rashmi. Can I ask a question? Of course, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so regarding abbreviated MRI, uh, thing is, uh, literature says that it, uh, the specificity is a uh, little less compared to the conventional MRI. So, yeah. the specificity is the main problem with uh, contrast enhanced MRI. So, if it further reduces the specificity, so how uh, effective it is in uh, screening patients? Yeah, it is, it is again, it's a trade-off, isn't it? Because here you're looking at a screening, a screening program essentially is, as the name suggests, you're just, it is not somewhere, you're just trying to pick up disease. So there is a little bit of trade-off and, uh, and you want to know if you're doing a population-based screening, which is not there in India, if, I, uh, uh, if I'm right about it not like the UK, which has got a national screening program where you are screening approximately like everybody um, um, after a certain age, if it's a part of the screening program, if it's high risk, then the, there is, a, there is a, a, a separate pathway for them. So if you're looking at something more personalized, then probably you're going to go for a full sequence MR. But if you're looking for a population-based screening, and if you want to reduce the time on your scanner because of the demands that we have here, then that is probably an answer um, which might be helpful to have an abbreviated MRI. And of course, there's always a trade-off. You don't know what the background enhancement is going to be like. So anyway, you're going to do a mammogram, and then you probably need to have your case selection. And of course, you have to be quite... Um, uh, open and honest with the ladies to say that, you know what, your breast density is quite high. So there is a possibility that things could not be picked up. So you've, you've got to be honest about it. But there is, like I said, it doesn't, one particular technique might not be applicable to all. The only thing is, um, what is the demand that you have? Um, or the time on the scanner. That's the only thing. And it is only for population. I wouldn't say abbreviated MRI if you're looking for um, probably mapping disease or if somebody's going for a mammoplasty, do an abbreviated MRI. No, they still go for the full sequence. Thank you. I think, yeah, regarding the CSM, since I have used uh, in many screening patients as well for contrast enhanced mammography, so as of now, I think guidelines is there only till the intermediate risk women, not for the high risk, because uh, these women are more sensitive to radiation and already they have high risk. So like I think in high risk women, still contrast enhanced mammography is not indicated and still limited to the up to the intermediate risk. If MRI cannot be done. In those ladies. Yeah, if they are claustrophobic and also you think you have to think of the radiation risk, isn't yeah. it? Because if it's going to be, they are quite young women who come for when it's family history screening. So um, there's always the radiation risk which goes with contrast enhanced mammography. Okay, thank you so much. It was very uh, nice lecture. I think uh, thank you. Uh, it was uh, well coverage of entire uh, breast MRI. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And Dr. Jailata, you want to add anything? Any questions, comments? Or any any other uh, uh, people on the program? Dr. Josna, Dr. Annapurna, I think uh, your experience. 
Um, good evening. Good evening. Hello. Yes. Yes, Dr. Uh, we are able to hear. Yeah. Dr. Gauri, thank you very much for such a lucid presentation. Uh, I had one, uh, one or two queries uh, regarding uh, MR breast. One is like uh, you said that abbreviated MR, you are using more like a screening uh, uh, in the screening scenario. So if you do pick up something abnormal on that, do you again go with the full-fledged uh, MR? Well, I like I said, um, the value for it is in the screening scenario, but then okay. it's a screening tool. And, but it would probably be not for mapping the disease. So when you, if you find something, then you have to do the full spectrum the full of imaging. Screen. Yeah, okay. full spectrum of imaging in that in instance. And like I said, we've still not rolled it out as a screening tool, but, but uh, there is a lot of experience in Europe, I think, where they use abbreviated MRI. And, mm -hmm. uh, but from what I have read and from what I have, heard so far is you go for your full spectrum of um, MRI um, examination then if there is something that is picked up. Okay and one more thing is that uh, you've been uh, speaking about these tiny foci of less than 5 mm which you cannot characterize. Mm. So in, in such cases in suppose it's a high risk patient where you're finding this foci how do you mm. counsel them? Because we really can't rule out, isn't it? Yeah. So you what do you just, tell the patient? Well, we don't, uh, we have, uh, the way the pathway works for us is we don't actually see the ladies unless we need to do any further imaging like an ultrasound. So we have a dedicated nurse who runs our family history clinics. So our report essentially would say that there are, a lot, uh, there are foci, but these are, um, and we, they, we cannot characterize it. But there is, but it doesn't look suspicious um, from what is available on the imaging. So essentially, what we we would do is, if you are worried about it, we would do a short interval MR. We would kind of, you know, it could be just a, a benign enhancement, which is less than five millimeters, which probably, you know, if you if you repeat it, you might not see it. But if it's unchanged, say in six months' time, then you know that it has been static. Right, so um, so we would just say what we are seeing on the MR and say it's too tiny to characterize. But if we are like say worried about it, if we think okay, this five mm of enhancement is different from all the background enhancement, we probably we might ask for a short interval MRI, um, and uh, and then pr probably see if it is static at that point. But if it, we are not worried about it, we would just say it is probably benign enhancement. Uh, because there's nothing nothing to explain it on the mammograms and we would call it a day. So we would probably, you know, there is, again, mm. address it and we double read our MRs, by the way. So um, so we always get a consensus opinion and, uh, and, you know, just if we are in doubt, then we just show it to a colleague and say, like, what do you think about it? And then we have a consensus opinion about it. Thank you very much. Ma'am, uh, good evening, ma'am. I'm Dr. Jayalata. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, of yes, course. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we are. I'm working in a regional cancer center, so we do we have a screening program which we are running after 35 uh, mammography and uh, high risk patients after 25 years screening it. Uh, it's not a nationalized, uh, government sponsored program, but but we are uh, doing it, ma'am. Uh, we are confining ourselves to sonomammography and uh, conventional, I mean, uh, um, X-ray mammography, a digital mammogram. But we are quite often we are seeing these multiple tiny lesions, uh, as Annapurna is saying, that on a uh, which are not conclusive even on FNAs or biopsies. So majority of them we are just following it up closely. Uh, after three months and after six months with Sono and uh, the, if needed, further investigations. So as of now, uh, uh, but uh, quite in our uh, scenario, there are quite many numbers actually coming up with uh, uh, the previous screening after, before six months or before one year. And now uh, with a little bit advanced, I mean, not uh, uh, more than a 5 mm lesions. So quite often we are seeing them. 
But uh, as of now, because of the limitations, we are confining to sonomammography and extramammography, ma'am. Uh, uh, only in indicated and highly uh, risk, high risk patients, we are going ahead with MR and uh, other investigations. So, so uh, my uh, doubt over here is, uh, even if you diagnose a one-sided breast malignancy, but there are quite, not a single, but few of them on the opposite, very tiny, not accessible, which we are, as of now, we are letting it uh, uh, wait for a close follow-up, ma'am. What is your experience on? So if you, so do, if you do find, if you do, if you do sorry, there is a little bit of background noise. I think somebody has to mute. Um, say, um, say if you are finding a cancer on one side, and you're finding these tiny yes. bits cell like things which you cannot characterize yes. on MRI, yes. you don't find yes. anything on the mammogram, you don't find anything on ultrasound. But you know that this lady has got a cancer in the contralateral breast. And you map the disease. Yes. They're going to have a wide local excision. You know they're going to have radiotherapy. So mm -hmm. your radiotherapy would probably take care of if it's any tiny yes. disease. Okay. Uh, yes, so we, we would not, um, we don't usually kind of, uh, if it's very tiny cells, which we cannot see anything, we don't do anything further with it. And again, oh. we are very limited by sometimes by resources as well. So, you know, and also if you strictly speaking, if you find something less than five millimeters um, and uh, say, think about a lung nodule. Yes. So again, are you going to follow it up? Are you going to do something about it forever and ever? No. So yeah. it was kind of the same kind of a principle can be applied here as well. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we are uh, actually focusing on them and then trying to do as uh, uh, much as possible the further investigation and confirmation. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, these multiplicity is making us a little bit of a, con uh, a concern. And uh, sometimes without any characterization, we do fine. But we are uh, doing as much as possible uh, MAR localization and also the uh, further uh, uh, confirmation and following it up with radiotherapy also. And thank you so much for wide uh, uh, expression of the lesions and the cases. They're very good. Uh, thank thank you. You. So what do you thank use for localization in your center? What device do you use for localization? We, we usually go for a, a, a guide wire localization with the, so no the surgeons will, uh, we localize and they biopsy it, ma'am. Um, okay. Yeah, we do that. Uh, the the every we are also running a screening of this thing, and uh, sometimes which they are lesions, they we are guide localize wire localization and then further biopsy. Okay, because Mostly. we've been doing wireless localization since the pandemic. Yes, um, ma'am. And uh, so we don't use a, a a wire. We do wireless. So we uh -huh. deploy our agent into the lesion and then. Uh, surgery is done on a separate day so uh, mm. we kind of we have uh, decoupled the uh -huh. localization oh, from nice. the surgery yeah. yes ma'am we we tried in one or two but we haven't made it as a, a regular process okay good evening good evening, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. like a servant my name huh okay Thank you. I have I have a question, Dr. Gauri. Uh, one of the indications you said is uh, uh, treatment response evaluation, right? Yeah. Uh, here, uh, we do bed CT for that. Uh, what about, uh, like, uh, where do you place bed CT there in UK? Well, <laughs> interesting question, because bed CT, again, is not available extensively uh, here um, and uh, we are uh, kind and the value of PET CT for um, again um, when we find the response to treatment most of breast cancers are kind of we don't see a lot of distal distal disease most of it is within the breast it could be multicentric or it could be contralateral and it goes to the nodes so we don't see a lot of disease beyond so um, the response to treatment, what we are looking for is primarily for 
breast conservation. And uh, we found that you can't actually map a lot of disease using PET um, for especially breast disease. Um, and uh, so we, uh, oh, the only thing where we've come across is they do a PET CT for something else and they found an incidental breast cancer. So then they come to us, but then they, we don't, uh, we don't follow it up with, we don't use PET CT. I, I can actually even think maybe I can count with my fingers the number of cases we've used PET to see how the follow-up is. I think what we have in terms of imaging tools, especially with the standard imaging is very helpful. Mammogram, just the bog standard mammograms, ultrasound and MRI. And of course now contrast has come to homosynthesis. Sometimes it's valuable, especially in follow-up, uh, but otherwise um, I don't think we, 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 we found there's a lot of value to do a PET scan. Uh, for breast cancer patients. But uh, in our scenario here, uh, the treatment response is mainly with uh, PET CT. I think all of the radiologists also will agree with me. Uh, and also the nodal disease, uh, the sensitivity is much high with uh, PET CT, I think. Yeah, I think in that way, breast cancer is slightly different because what they're going to do is See, even if we found a nodal burden, if we have more than three nodes or so, then we do a full CT staging, okay? But often we don't see any distal disease because breast cancers often metastasize, as we know, to the regional nodes. And if they get neoadjuvant chemo, then we do a, a post-treatment scan. We do a scan maybe midway to the treatment and then later. And if there's been a good nodal response, they don't excise all the nodes. They would still, if there's a complete treatment response, we sometimes put a marker into the biopsy node. So the surgeon often takes out the biopsy node. So we don't, and of course they would get radiotherapy. Now there is a lot of trial. There was a Z11 trial and then there was another trial in the US uh, whether they are, we are over treating the axilla. So they are coming to a point to say that should you be biopsying nodes in the axilla if you see abnormal nodes because you're going to be giving treatment anyway. So it's kind of, I think it falls in a spectrum, which is slightly, I think, um, different um, uh, with breast cancer. So maybe that's why we, we just don't do very much of um, imaging beyond what we would do as our routine standard imaging. Maybe they must be doing sentinel node biopsies also, right? Yes, yes they all get a sentinel node biopsy. And if it is, if it's, uh, even if there is, uh, if, if it's a normal ultrasound scan of the axilla, they would get a sentinel node biopsy. Um, and uh, if, even if we pick up maybe two nodes, we tend to say how many number of abnormal nodes when we do an ultrasound scan. So if there is a high nodal burden, they would get a full staging CT. If they have maybe one node, then we tend to biopsy the node. We put a clip in the node and uh, the surgeon tries to take out the clipped node. Thank you, Thank you very much. Any, any more questions? I don't see any questions in the chat box too. So that means uh, the presentation is very clear. Uh, Dr. Gauri, thank you very much again. From thank you, thank you. Rest. And uh, I would thank all the audience who joined with us in, in this weekend. And the next webinar is on uh, 22nd. It's by Dr. Balamurugan, again from UK. Uh, he's going to talk on uh, abdominal trauma imaging, pearls and pitfalls. So see you all on 22nd. And thank you, Dr. Gauri, for being Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. Bye. Bye-bye. Good day. Thank you.